Augusto uh, manage the, the question and answer and discussion. I see that compared to Europe, there is a, a, a difference in the scale of the analysis of the, the environment. Here in Europe, we have small piece of land inhabited by, by a lot of people, and we cannot do the same um, process that you, you do in Australia. It is completely different. Uh, uh, this is a first point. And then a second point is that uh, in Europe, at, at least it's what I, what I, what I see with, with my students, with people around me, uh, is that we separate what is natural, natural from what is uh, man-made. And there is a sort of, uh, we make real a, a difference between these two uh, systems that we see around and we protect what is natural or more natural from what men built and so to mixing, uh, to try to do what you, you do in, uh, in, in, in Australia is really difficult here in Europe. We, the, the, the process is, is quite opposite. Uh, we, we, we try to protect what is natu natural and eventually to combine human with nature, but um, not transforming the, the ecosystem. It's not possible to do this here. We, we have transformed what it was possible to do in the past. And now what, what we have as natural, we keep safe and we try to, so to, to, to propose a change in the environment, as you do in Australia. It's, but I, but I understand uh, your, your point of view and I, 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 I appreciate and I, I try to find a, a way out in the middle between what you do in Australia and what could be done here in Italy, for example, but I, I don't have an answer for at the moment. Mm. I think um, just remember, I remember when you talked to me uh, last, late last year, early this year about Albarella and the, and the problems of Albarella. Um, they're a combination of environmental problems and social and cultural problems. And, um, you know, tourism is uh, such an important part of that place. And, um, you know, as scientists, you have a role in studying the reality of the place in terms of, you know, the effect of tourism on the environment, um, but also, you know, effects that come to Agorella from other places, like from global warming or uh, sea quality, seawater quality and things like that. So you can study the reality of them, but um, you can also, I know that you, Augusto, are also a, somewhat of a utopian thinker. So you can, uh, you know, there's an opportunity for you to propose preposterous and outlandish solutions for Albarella that go well beyond just understanding the reality of the place, but imagining and proposing what it really should be like in the year 2100. That's my challenge to you. Yes, yes, it is what we are trying to do just now. Huh? And, and, and in Albarella is quite a, is an island, uh, mostly private, and it is possible to go in this direction in Albarella. Uh, out of Albarella is another world. Uh, so um, I understand what, what you propose. And, we try to do in, that, in this direction, but for example, we we can propose to to have new plantation in the island, occupying 
half the year uh, now on, in, in grassland, but we cannot impose this and it is, it go against the necessity the inhabitants have to have large free from trees space. And finally, our proposition probably will stop at the level of proposition. It will never be accepted and implemented in this island. I don't, or partially, only on a, on a little free space and not in, in all the area, uh, this plantation could be done. And the, there is a, uh, we have to meet what economical uh, perspective with natural perspective. And at the moment, economic perspective dominate on what we could do for, imp for improving the, the environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, but it's the pragmatic, uh, it's a pragmatic problem there that um, I wonder if, uh, because I know that um, one of the, the big parts of Alan Yeomans' um, utopian vision for solving climate change is also depends on economics. So maybe that's a good opportunity to bring Alan in to talk about uh, his vision. Um, uh, you can hear me all right? Yes. Okay. There's a couple of things that uh, were mentioned there that uh, Augustus mentioned was the difference in farming in Europe. I think the biggest difference in farming in Europe occurred and started in the 1936s, 37s. At that stage of the game, the first, it was the Second World War. After that, chemical agriculture became the biggest form of agriculture in Europe. So Europe changed from, to my way, a marvelous way of farming to what became a typical farming situation, maybe with smaller farms. But the soil and the improvement of the soil was not the main thing that was being considered. It was almost a stereotype copy of a chemical type agriculture. And that copy has been used all over the world because the chemical companies sold it to people. And I bet every, every farm in, in uh, Italy, it was uses urea and things like that. And that is a big step backwards. Um, that's, that's my feeling about what you're talking about there. In my, do I go on with what I'm talking about now or you finished? Okay, well. Oh. Eh? <laughs> Sorry. Go um, ahead, Alan, go ahead. Okay. Right on. Um, first of all, I'd like to compliment you. You were talking about all these innovative people. And in all honesty, I haven't come across anybody more innovative than yourself. You managed to do things that I've never seen other people do. So don't kid yourself. Among the great innovators, you are one of them. Now, on my own work, long time ago, 30 years ago, more, I realized because I was very much involved in, in um, meteorology and understanding soil at the same time, I realized that the destruction of our atmosphere was a very serious and dangerous thing. And so I became, that became my passion. And as time goes by, nothing really has happened that has done anything to change the course we're now pursuing. So what I've, my emphasis is on, is what I'm gonna talk about, uh, is really on the, the necessity to concentrate purely on soil. It doesn't matter how big the land area is, whether it's small, big, it doesn't matter. It is the, we, are, we should be growing humus in our soil. That is what I'm talking about. And I've, I wrote out a paper because I've never been on one of these conferences before. 
So I had so much time to do, so I got a paper, which I will read you if you're ready for that now. Okay. The way I see it is since industrialization, we have added just over a trillion tons of excess carbon dioxide to the Earth's air, which guarantees continuous massive destabilization of the Earth's atmospheric and oceanic systems. And that is unfortunately permanent unless we do something about it. And we don't have a lot of time. Even if we reduce emissions to zero tomorrow, that one change, the overload, the extra carbon dioxide blanket that we put there will still be there. Emissions are not really the answer. We have one, only one plausible option. Our objective must be to totally remove the existing greenhouse gas overload by turning the carbon dioxide into soil carbon. More accurately, I would say, more honestly, humus. And that removal has to start now. And I believe it's got to be completed within eight, 10 years, or we're on a one-way trip that we can't reverse out of. I designed and now build all the soil test equipment necessary to measure the changes we need. The equipment can be comfortably collect samples, screen them, reduce the volume to less than one kilogram soil sample, and then readily place the loss, place that sample in a loss of ignition Yeoman's carbon still. Or it can be tested back in any laboratory. It's the testing machinery is not really something that can be used by farmers. And unfortunately, they're only going to use it if they did for an hour or so a year. Loss on ignition in our carbon still is a, diff is a little different to what has been done in the past. A good sample size was always one or two grams. But with a 500 hectare paddock farm, to be able to collect a portion of soil of only one or two grams that was truly representative to that big farm is in itself a very difficult thing to do. So it is much, it's much more practical to have a sample that a farmer can dig up with a shovel, something that you can feel and get a hold of without it all being done under various considerations in the laboratory. And in the carbon seal, heated air is forced through the sample and a thermocouple now, which is not with yours, Augustus, a thermocouple now sits inside the actual soil sample. Pronto? What, what happened then? Si. Just, I just si. keep talking. I just keep talking, I suppose. Um, in the carbon seal, Peter's air is forced through the soil itself. So there is a marvelous control of the actual temperature within the soil. If the carbon still heated, uses heated air, is forced through the sample, the thermocouple sits right inside the sample, and there is a constant knowledge of the temperature actually right inside the sample itself. Then input temperatures, air, airflow info, is it, it can be increased or decreased to control the temperature of the actual loss and ignition test procedure. If it gets too hot or it gets too cold, it's easy. You just put more, dry more heat on the incoming gas, air. And if it gets, or, or again, you can increase the temperature or you can slow down the, the, the cooling processes. But if it gets too hot, which was a little problem for a little while, you can reduce the airflow so that there is not so much ignition, and that will bring it down quite comfortably under control. Or in an extreme case, if you're even testing pure humus, which is highly inflammable stuff, you can then divert it so that the gases going into the test machine are actually nitrogen. So any spontaneous ignition just goes away. And by doing that and holding that, the results we get are always within about half of 1% of the actual content of the soil. Um, we've 
it was necessary um, in the calibration of a piece of equipment like that, that we took soil, we took subsoil, subsoil samples, maybe a meter deep, containing virtually no organic matter at all. And to those, that material, we added um, peat, which is a very close chemically to um, ordinary humus. A little different, but from a Nishan point of view, very similar. So we would add a certain, quant a known quantity of peat, and therefore a known quantity of carbon dioxide would be added. And then we would test that. Then let's say we got a, a reading of um, 100 grams or 90 grams or something like that of loss on ignition. But we know we only put 50 grams in. So the other chemical reaction were things that were happening in the soil outside of that reaction. So by plotting a curve of 50 grams, 100 grams, 150 grams, 200 grams, we could draw a curve that showed the exact relationship between what you measured in the carbon still and what the quantity that the farmer put in, because we did the same thing. I mean, we put it in instantaneously and the farmer put it in over the course of the year. Um, and the results have always been extremely accurate. So that's how we maintain that accuracy, which I think is probably a long way more accurate than any other system being used. And it's because of a few of those innovative ideas that we have. And this has been my, my dream, my hobby, my the thing that drives me to whatever I'm doing. Um, and we get back now, we get back to the overload in our atmosphere. And the numbers spell it out. The atmosphere overloads is a thousand billion tons of carbon dioxide. There are about 5 billion hectares of agricultural land on Earth. And roughly speaking, there's about 8 billion people. And it takes about 2.13 tonnes of atmospheric carbon dioxide to produce one tonne of true soil humus. So one, hect one hectare of soil, one third of a metre deep, about a foot deep, weighs roughly about 4,000 tonnes. Poor soil contains less than a couple of percent humus. Very rich soils contain as much as 10, 15, 20 percent humus. If we increase the world's average agricultural soils humus level by a 2 percent down to about a third of a metre deep, about a foot deep, simply by changing a few farming practices and concentrating more on the creation of humus, and the creation of crops, global warming would cease. Organic farming, biodynamic farming, the average backyard vegetable grower, the ancient farming practices that created the terra preta soil found all through the Amazon basin, originally called terra preta de Indio, or Indian black soil, proves it's easy to do. It's common for all the above soils to have humus contents exceeding 15% sometimes up to 25%. Check out Terra Preta on Google. It's a very good example. We're only talking about a 2%, 2% increase in humus in the world's agricultural soil. But we've got to convince people to do it. And the science involved, look, it's not rocket science here. We convert our atmosphere's carbon dioxide overload into soil humus, exactly how well, we don't care. We just don't care. There are many known techniques. Organic farming is always producing those sort of results. But we, we, we just make our government pay our farmers for doing it. And the farmers will. To date, the only real problem has been practically and economically measuring the increase in farm humus levels. But no more. It's now both extremely practical and extremely economic, and also can be done by the landowner. The farmer, along with a responsible observer, and it's only a once a year test procedure anyway. Optical systems, which they are 
from mining all over the place now, optical systems, ground sensing radar, it can't help us. Why? Because they can't tell the difference between fibrous living plants and humus. Humus that's invariably passed to a two millimeter set. And humus, if it's 100 mils deep, the ground sensing radar and all these optical things won't find it. We are talking about humus that's got to be created three, four, five hundred millimeters deep, a whole deep section of it. And if we do that, there won't be too many farms in the world that we will need to make available to be able to do that thing. If we can now, if we can now remove all our atmosphere's carbon dioxide and we pay our farmers for doing it, the bill for the world is going to be around a thousand million dollars, US dollars. And that'll be a trillion dollars a year for 10 years, total 10 trillion. But to understand the perspective, the US national debt is already 23 trillion. We're a little company, but we got a national debt of nearly 1 trillion. So these numbers are all quite reasonable, but they are certainly not reasonable for anything but government to fund. To understand that, oh, I told you, the, I'm just reading this again, the perspective of the weight of um, what the US has got in national debt. And incidentally, some additional benefits result by adding that humor, some incredible benefits. The food produced, to start off with, it tastes great. Not only does it taste great, it's also incredibly more nutritious. One little thing that I'm not putting down here, I did some tests in the carbon still using organic soil and ordinary soil, just poor soil. And the ash content that was left was about four times more ash content left in the test apparatus from the organic soil, which meant clearly that that soil had a lot of minerals because that's what the ash content is. So that mineral content, that's the advantage in our eating that sort of stuff. And then also calling climate change a science, it implies it's, it's all a deep esoteric subject that people got to study it and understand it. And it's all up in the clouds, impossible for mere mortals to follow it all back. Ah. Alan. Yes. <laughs> Alan, we, we used your carbon steel in, in Alvarela. Huh? Yes. And we get good results. We compared the, the measurements you did done with your right. machine, and we compared with modern and other types of uh, uh, investigation, and we find a really good correlation between what you can do with, with your carbon steel and what other people can do with other methods. Look at this, Alan. Here is the mathematical formula that links carbon steel, total organic carbon, with scalar primates, total organic carbon. On the same soil sample, a very, very good linear relationship with a coefficient of one, a high R square, and a slope with a very low probability of being wrong. My compliment. With the first picture and now without litter. So it works well, your camera still. And yesterday we, and today, uh, from now, we also finish it. We also uh, find out that the, the fighting against the, the, the warming climate is a social challenge. It's not only a scientific uh, to, um, challenge, but it's a social challenge. We, we have to uh, uh, look as said socially engaged art, we have also to do socially engaged science. 
we, we have to, 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 to combine everything, as you say just now, 